the millennia, culture has been shaped by the stories we tell. And if you think about it, advertising is telling stories that are backed by billions of dollars to have them heard. As advertisers, we have the power to shape what society sees as normal or aspirational or acceptable. When we tell stories involving all the full spectrum of people that we see in the world, we actually make our brands seem more vibrant, more culturally connected and just more interesting. I was always different, the robot. And I'm convinced that we can normalize gender equality with what we choose to show in our ads and who we choose to make them. And this is so important because what you see shapes who you believe you can be. I passionately believe equality releases both potential and opportunity in people and therefore can make a massive difference to their lives. Hello everybody. For the last couple of years, we've been thinking about how a brand-led organisation like Diageo can have the biggest possible impact in how we tackle gender imbalance in our advertising. Now, whilst we don't by any means think that we have all the answers, especially on the broader facets of diversity, we'd love to share a few things that we've learned in our journey so far to make our advertising more gender equal. With 200 brands across 180 countries and about 28,000 people working in Diageo, we've learned that driving gender equality in our advertising requires a lot more than just changing our brand work. It's about changing our own organization's culture, it's about being brave, and it's about agitating for change more broadly in the industry. Is Lions Live? The seven learnings we'll share today are about change in our business, change on our brands, and change in our industry. This is a topic we care deeply about at Diageo, and we'll keep working hard and learning in order to make more gender equal advertising. We shared these learnings with you today in the hope that they will help you when you're facing similar questions. So the first thing we've learned is that it starts with us. Now change begins at home and often the more powerful signals of cultural change come from the top. Just over a decade ago, our executive committee was almost entirely male, but today women make up about 40% of our executive committee and more broadly, the exec represent six different nationalities and speak multiple languages. And this important and symbolic change has normalized greater gender balance across the organization. So for example, in marketing, our organization of senior female leaders is now 50% across the world. Getting a more diverse organization is a massive first step and enabler. It, it creates profound change um, for everybody within the organization. And when I compare it to what it felt like when I first started in Diageo over 20 years ago, this inclusive and more informal tone that is set from the top is changing everything. It's enabling us all to have much more honest conversations, to move much, much faster, and for each of us to bring our best selves to every work situation. Change isn't just happening at a senior level. Every year we hold an inclusion week at Diageo, organized by passionate employees to accelerate inclusion within our culture from the grassroots up. In 2019, we held our third Inc. Week it was amazing. Panel discussions broadcast across the world, numerous celebrations, and I think most inspiringly, powerful personal storytelling in all of our offices across the world. So this is what our employees are doing for us, but what are we doing for them? And one of the most important ways we can support change is through our policy. So I want to share with you just one example. Now, this is an area that needed radical change to accelerate gender equality, where barriers to career progression had to be removed and where talent has to be retained and nurtured. I'm talking about parental leave. In 2019, we introduced a new family leave policy and we set a global minimum standard in a majority of markets from Europe to North America to Thailand, Philippines, Singapore, Russia, Colombia, Venezuela and more 
we have finally equalised family leave. So that means that both men and women can take up to six months fully paid leave and up to a year off work. And it applies regardless of gender or sexuality or how people become parents, whether that's through birth, through surrogacy or through adoption. To tell you a little bit more about the impact that this is having, I'd like to introduce two of my colleagues who were the first to avail of the policy. Arnett, who is about to go on paid leave for the first time with his third child, and Irvin, a first time dad who has been on leave for six months. Here's what they have to say. We found out very early in our pregnancy, which was great because it took the worry um, out of what we were going to do for work as a family. This is my third child and with the first two, I found the first few months really tiring. And actually the ability now to be very mindful of, of the first few months and be there with the family is, is absolutely amazing. <laughs> if I'm honest, my partner was almost close to tears when I told her about this policy. She has her own uh, successful business uh, in Glasgow. So we were very lucky that this policy came into play when it did. The response of my, for my friends on the parental leave has, has been different. There, are, you know, there's some people who are absolutely delighted. There's others that have shared, like, what's this going to do for your career? I thought it was going to be a six-month holiday. It's not. Um, it's the hardest thing I've ever done. It's the most rewarding thing I've ever done. It's satisfying. It's hard. It's hard. <laughs> it's very hard. There is a stigma on paternity leave. I know a lot of my friends don't take all of it. I think a lot of them show how far there is really to go in this normalising this behaviour. It's really important for the employer to play an active role in promoting taking uh, um, paternity leave. More companies should be doing this. It is a very positive step in the right direction. When you have a company like Diageo who's willing to go above and beyond globally, um, it does build an enormous amount of oil and you feel like you're going to give exactly the same back when you go back into the workspace. I guess if I had to give um, fathers that were thinking about taking print all you've one message, it would be just do it. <laughs> you will never regret taking six months yeah. to be with your child, to bond. So make sure that you use the opportunity to create an exceptional memory that will last a lifetime. I think it has made me a better father for years to come. Okay, so we've learned about how we've worked to change our business to create a more inclusive culture. But this is CAN, and I know you'll be more interested in how we've approached this on our brands. So does culture shape brands, or can brands shape culture? I think we'll probably all agree about the former, but we also believe that brands can play a role in shaping culture. As advertisers, we spend billions collectively on the stories we tell. Stories which have the potential to constrain how people can see themselves or to inspire them. And we know that this is an issue in advertising. Women account for about 80% of all purchasing decisions, and yet they're often absent or portrayed in a really regressive way. Which brings me to our second lesson, we've learned that change is easier to say than to do. In 2017, the Gina Davis Institute looked at how the portrayal of women had changed over 10 years of Cannes Lions winners. Despite all the conversation, we were surprised to learn that there had been no discernible shift. Women were often not present, or if they were, they were silent in domestic roles and often objectified. It provoked us to think about the role that we could play in making things better and why there'd been no change. We recognised that it was a complex issue, that markets across the world were at different stages and that our own unconscious bias could play a role in making change even harder despite our best attempts. In our business, we did unconscious bias training and we also did inclusive leadership training because we recognised that it wasn't enough to remove bias, we also had to create a really inclusive environment. In order to progress around the world, we learned another lesson. It was really important to understand how varied gender progression was around the world. We recognised the need for deep understanding of how women are portrayed in popular culture. 
we analyze stories from popular visual culture, politics, music, and advertising from across the world. The first step in our journey was to really understand and bring to life some of the cultural similarities and differences. In Brazil and Colombia, people are dissatisfied that the women who shaped culture are not being represented. Across the world, we saw an appetite for change and room for brands to be involved in both defining and disrupting the conversation. We had to audit all our content to understand a benchmark of where we were. We needed to understand the stereotypes about women around the world, and we needed to listen to our agency partners and then needed to codify where we were going. We recognized a standard debrief was not gonna be enough to get to our outcome. We needed to structure our insight in such a way as to provoke the right conversations during creative development and change some of our behaviors. We learned we needed a simple framework. So this framework had to be simple, accessible, and actionable. It has to work across multiple brands, across multiple markets. It has to be applicable for different stages of communications development and sit well in different cultural environments from Nigeria to Brazil to US. The result was our progressive gender portrayal framework, encouraging consistency and alignment in creative development of all media across all global platforms. Now that's in bar, that's content, that's experiential, that's everything. And the framework aims to radically alter the way we approach the representation, the perspective, the agency, and the characterization of women in our advertising. And I'm going to talk about each of those in turn. The first area is representation. Now, representation is about who is there and who gets to speak and for whom this brand is intended. It's not just about ensuring that women are as equally present as men, but that we represent a broad range of different types of women that our consumers can relate to and not just in supporting roles. The second area is perspective. Now, perspective is a little more subtle and nuanced, and it's really about who's directing the action and who's framing the story, who's the person whose perspective we're seeing, who's directing the attention, who's narrating, who do we imagine the audience to be, and who is behind the camera. The next area is agency. Now, agency is about power. It's about ensuring that the women we see behave in ways that demonstrate control over and understanding of their lives, and that we speak to them with the same degree of respect as we do to the men we address. And finally, characterization. Now, characterization is all about making sure that the people we show in our advertising are developed, rounded characters, that they have stories to tell and that we allow those stories to be shared. That they're not just cast in roles because they're a woman, but because they have an amazing story that needs to be heard. And many of those guidelines can be applied to anyone we see in our ads, but in the first instance, we think of them in terms of, of women because that's what's most needed in terms of reform. We uh, use this framework in bite-sized training modules for marketeers and agency partners to really help them use the framework in their day-to-day -day work. And part of this training is actually about enabling us to identify our own biases that inform the way we approach the work. The framework was rolled out to 1,200 marketeers in just six months, which really demonstrated the commitment and pace we have in terms of driving this change. Whilst implementing this change, we learn our next big lesson. You need to adopt a learning mindset. The issues are complex for people to navigate. And while all our responses are legitimate, it can be difficult to overcome our own biases and understand how our audiences might react. Make it okay for people to get it wrong and learn and use measurement to keep everyone honest. As part of building this culture, We've been really honest about work we've done that hasn't met the mark on gender. We used to have a brand proposition on Bailey's, which was about making women shine, totally ignoring the fact that women absolutely didn't need a Bailey's to make them shine. This brand proposition led to the here's to us work you can see on screen now that showed very stereotypical portrayals of gender. We've moved far beyond this on Bailey's now with a purpose around delicious adult treats, and the brand is in much better health as a result. We're gonna show you a recent example from Guinness, which shows why measurement is important too. 
In Europe, Guinness has a long-standing association with rugby, and the work typically has focused on male narratives, such as that of Gareth Thomas. Tapping into the cultural conversation on sport, we use the real story of a Japanese pioneering rugby team who blazed a trail all the way to the 1991 World Cup despite social disapproval. It's an example which caused us to think long and hard about how to portray women effectively outside of traditional roles. Our learning highlighted how important it would be to show that it was society as a whole and not just men who disapproved of them and ensured we depicted them with respect and authenticity. Here's a clip of the actual women from the team who helped us tell their story authentically. ワールドカップに出たいと決めて一生懸命トレーニングした時はもう生活の 90% Hearing these real-life stories echoes why we're striving to change bias around the world. The Quant Metrics post-launch helped us understand how the work landed and contributes to our total body of learning. 81% of people agreed that the ad portrayed women as positive role models. In this case, we got it right. Getting this right is hard, but by using the framework, fostering open conversations, and using the measurement tools sensitively, we create for ourselves the best chance of living up to the standards that we've set. So, we've talked a bit about what we've learned about driving change in our business and change in our brands. But now I want to talk about something that I'm personally very, very passionate about, which is about driving change in our industry. We think it's really important to amplify what we're all doing, to, to use the influence we have within our own networks and to collaborate with other partners to ensure that all boats rise. Which leads me on to the sixth lesson, which is we really believe that together is better. The OnStereotype Alliance was convened by UN Women with the aim of eradicating harmful gender stereotypes in advertising. And the focus is on empowering women in all of their diversity, but also addressing harmful masculinities to help create a gender equal world. And we're incredibly proud to have been one of the founder members and to work alongside businesses like Unilever and P&G, Google and many more. And I would really encourage you to get involved because we've learned so much from that partnership. We've learned so much from the conversations, the work we've done together to create change, an example of which is the partnership we had with Unilever to combine forces to create a progressive on stereotype playbook for UN women and for their members. But we also needed to look at the supply chain in our own creative work, particularly with industry stats showing that only 17% of creative directors are female in the UK. So a few years ago, Sil, our CMO who retires this month, sent a letter to the entire agency network asking how they're supporting diversity and inclusion and to share what plans they had to address any imbalances. The letter asked to see the percentage of women in leadership roles, to understand the gender pay gap, um, and to see the percentage of women, most importantly, in creative leadership roles. And fortunately, our partners were incredibly receptive to that. They too are trying to drive change and create a more inclusive industry. And what we learned was that whilst most of our agencies are broadly gender balanced, there is this gap in creative leadership. And one of the reasons cited is that women are actually dropping out just as they're about to uh, be promoted into leadership roles. So we really wanted to understand that more and see how we could help as a client. So we partnered with an amazing organisation called Creative Equals. Now they run a very, very powerful returner programme to help women who've dropped out of the industry for whatever reason to come back uh, and start working again. So these returners do a refresher course, they're mentored by creative geniuses in all of our agencies, they work on briefs on some of our biggest global brands. But to understand from the returners themselves how important it is, let's hear from them. 
I think we really are living in a moment where creativity needs to change. The fact that only 12% of creative directors are women is absolutely terrifying. The challenge that we have with the creative sector is this phrase, you're only as good as your last piece of work, right? And our job actually at Creative Equals, instead of looking at CV gaps as problems, to look at them as creativity's gifts. I was thinking I am I'm foreign, I am black. I just kept thinking in a creative industry, I might not be taken seriously because I have no confidence. Tomorrow we get the briefs and I'm feeling petrified actually. You've all been really brave to say, no, I'm actually gonna change this and I'm gonna come back to the creative industry to make a difference. We're not going to crack it, we're gonna make it big. We will, we will live up to our expectations of ourselves. I surely will try. And now to our final lesson. You need global leaders and local champions. Globally and around the world, we've appointed champions for this important work. Sil Sala has been important in driving the overall agenda. Our CMO for India, Julie Brahman, is responsible for creating a wave of change both inside Diageo and across India. As a global organization, we need to ensure that the vision we create is embedded locally. And by appointing local champions, we can ensure that we meet our ambition in every corner of the globe. What we've shared today is seven steps that we have found have been helpful in accelerating our progress on uh, addressing gender imbalance in our work and, and making our work more equal and inclusive. So we hope that they help and inspire and make a difference to the work that you're doing too. We also know that we have a lot more work to do, continuing to step up in gender and making sure that we're being inclusive and embracing all facets of diversity in our work and in our team, whether that's race, whether it's LGBTQ+, whether it's social mobility and beyond. We hope that we continue to learn together, to share together, and most importantly, to collaborate together so that we can ensure that we create this change together. Women simply switch off uh, adverts that feature negative stereotypes. 55% of mums feel that the advertising sector doesn't represent them. Everybody just wants to see the real world we all live in portrayed in our content. My wake up call is to understand the unbelievable power of women. So our opportunity here is to shape culture and make sure that we can portray gender in the most positive way. Diageo have announced a generous new parental leave policy. Oh.